Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you today. Um, the, our presentation today originated in research that Seagull Scientific conducted in Q4 of last year. Uh, we canvassed AIDC thought leaders, like two of our panelists today, about labeling trends for this dynamic time and beyond. Um, also participating in this research were Dr. Kevin Barucco, who is director of the Auto ID Lab at the U of Memphis. His inclusion was particularly exciting uh, because his position offers a unique perspective on emergency technologies. Uh, the CEO of my company, Harold Foe, was included. He possesses the enviable combination of a deep understanding of both AIDC technology and the market forces that shape its development and use. Uh, we also talked with Andrew Morris Epson, who covers new innovations in the chemistry of labeling, like substrates and inks as well as the importance of traceability, and Richard Brown at Digimod with insight on brand protection and anti-counterfeiting. This research report will be available to you um, after the presentation and is going to email it to all attendees, uh, along with links to the recording. Um, but let's get started. Uh, let's introduce our, the two panelists uh, and experts that are with us today. Uh, Chris, would you like to go first? Hey, thank you, Elizabeth, and hello, everybody. I am Chris Brown, as Elizabeth has said. I am with the company TSC Printronics Auto ID. We are one of the big manufacturers of printers for barcode labels and RFID labels. And my particular position is RFID subject matter expert. And Stephen. Hello everyone, uh, Steve Kitty. I'm from GS1 Global Office. Uh, GS1 is a not-for-profit organization and uh, we're set up uh, basically with uh, one global office and 116 member organizations. Uh, and each one of those member organizations is in a different country. And uh, they help localize our standards based on regulations. My job within GS1 is I take care of the subject matter experts. So within my team, we manage um, the majority of the standards that GS1 uh, has, as well as some of the, uh, the services that we supply. And I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this meeting. It should be fun. Back to okay. you, Elizabeth. Let's get started. Uh, so there's been an unprecedented block of black swan supply chain events over the past two years. Uh, Black Swan event is something that's a surprise, has a major impact, and it's often rationalized after the fact. Uh, there's been a tactical shift of supply chains to supply webs. Um, these events are driving many of the trends we're going to talk today, talk about today. So first, regulations and consumer expectations are driving more information on packaging. Stephen, can you talk about this in context of GS1's global migration to uh, 2D? Yeah, of course. It's, first of all, I agree. Um, it's regulations, consumer expectations, and more and more now it's business use cases that are driving the need for this additional information on PAC. So for many of the audience, the global migration to 2D is probably uh, even something new to them. And why are we even doing that? I need to maybe take one quick little step back and uh, roll back the clock to 2019, 2020, when GS1 launched uh, a project called the Future of Unpacked Coding. It was really to look at uh, why the proliferation of uh, barcodes and marks and tags are happening on, on products. And to get a good understanding, we brought together uh, 40 uh, different member organizations. So those are the ones from uh, different countries, brought them together to try and do a workshop. And from that workshop, we had a, a plan to go forward to try and find out what's going on and how we can help industry. The group did um, a significant amount of voice of the customers uh, all over the world, getting a, an understanding of why these different things are going on. Uh, we uncovered pilots and implementations for 2Ds that we didn't even know were happening. And a lot of them were through uh, mutual agreement. Uh, from that, we determined that there's really beyond the fact of regulations, there was uh, regulations were driving traceability, but there was also inventory management things that were happening, the consumer engagement, safety, sustainability. 
in, and one of the early things that we talked about at that point was the, and this is back in 2019, 2020, was the digital product passport. And that's a, really a new regulation that's in Europe that uh, is now really coming to the forefront and, and will affect you know, anything going into Europe. And the idea behind that passport is to understand the composition of the goods of the product coming in and how, how you can recycle it or reuse it. And of course, other others uh, of the in the business side were looking at trying to improve the packaging. Beyond those pilots and voice of customers and the research and finding out the use cases that, that are really driving this ad these additional barcodes, we also did uh, hired research with regards to uh, where scanners are today, uh, what's happening there, and also what's going on uh, in the tag market. Market from all of that. We uh, GS1 then took all of those findings from the future on pack coding and actually launched two major programs. Uh, one is around the modernization of EPC RFID tags, and really Chris is the expert there, and uh, we'll talk about that. The that work has a lot to do with aligning the EPC tag and its encoding with the 2D barcode in, encoding and how to uh, help industry there and make things a little bit simpler. And then there was the global migration to 2D, which is what we're going to talk about here. That one really is about managing the, uh, migration globally across all different sectors, uh, but first focusing on retail. Today, if you picked up a product, you, you, you know, consumers are going to expect to be able to scan a QR code and get product information. Um, the products themselves have, have additional, additional information on them for regulations and brand use, um, such as making sure the you know, a, a data matrix on there to make sure that the right label is being put on the right product. And the other thing about all of those symbols and barcodes on the pack, they all actually only had one real use uh, case. And so they didn't take advantage of the fact that um, barcodes, especially 2Ds, can handle more data. So brands and retailers have really been pushing to say, hey, we really want to now get back to one barcode and, and try and you know, clean up the space and make things a lot easier. Today, obviously, uh, EN UPC has its limitations. It really only identifies the, the product that it's on. And 2Ds can accomplish a lot more. Within GS1, we have you know, the, the GS1 data matrix and the GS1 QR code, which are really for business to business and business to government uses. But um, unless, of course, you have an app. But we also had a new standard that we brought in, which is called the Digital Link Standard. And that's actually for, that actually can be encoded into really any data carrier, but in specifically uh, QR codes, which can be scanned uh, with mobile devices and data and, and data matrix, not GS1 data matrix, but data matrix, that, which also can be scanned from mobile devices and give instant links out to data because it's using a URL. But on top of that, it's a structured URL, so it can be used in the supply chain at the point of sale, and it's really a, a barcode that it, a, um, a design of a syntax that can go can bridge the gap across many areas. So that mission specific that uh, 2D and retail work uh, has really launched a mission specific work group that's underway now. That mission specific work groups. Uh, initial work is to define what barcodes are going to be used in retail. It's a really large group that's come together. There's about 160 members of that mission specific work group. We actually have, because it's, it's a global thing, we actually have two meetings, one that is uh, Pacific time, time zone and one that's in the Atlantic time zone. And we have brands, retailers from the consumer goods forum, uh, manufacturers from around the world, solution providers, and of course, GS1 member organizations all working together to do those uh, to do that work to define uh, what barcodes are going to be used, where are they going to where are they going to be on the product, what data might be in the barcodes, and uh, in addition to that, what text could be to, to be there. So really groundbreaking changes and how the transition will be, be, be worked on. Beyond that, you heard earlier uh, that Kevin Barrisso was uh, part of this uh, um, document that we put together on the trends. And Kevin is working with uh, us and we're doing 2D uh, retail testing at, at his lab in Memphis with, the, with, our, with GS1's AIDC lab equipment. 
And we had manufacturers like uh, Zebra, Data Logics, uh, Honeywell, and NCR that have donated their, their scanning equipment to be part of that test. And those software manufacturers are updating their software and we're working together. Uh, and we've just, we're just in the, in the process of re releasing the tier one results, which with regards to what happens with only GTIN in that barcode. And, what, and it's really just isolated to a barcode at a time so we can create a baseline. Now we're moving into our tier two, which is the G10 plus the additional information that uh, helps create those use cases and, and understand how quickly they can be moved and make sure that we're not slowing down uh, retail. And then the next and final level of that testing is going to be code creating blur codes, which has to do with that transition period that we're seeing. And the overall ambition of the retail migration is by 2027, brands and uh, can then decide what barcode they're going to have on there. It could be a 2D or it could it could stay as a 1D because the brand doesn't see an advantage. So we're not deprecating or removing UPC EAN. We're basically expanding the, uh, the possibilities, uh, but really within a very controlled amount of barcodes so that we can maintain that all important interoperability. The group now um, beyond the, the 2D uh, mission specific work group and that lab testing. We also have a solution providers group that's working on the more advanced problems uh, in, in that focus group. We're um, working together to build uh, a consensus around what's the best solution to try and optimize the, the scanning environment, the AID scan, scanning environment around the world. Uh, we also have collateral, like a getting started guide, a decision tree and white papers is going on. And our community engagement has really been talking to the retailers, manufacturers, solution providers, and the CGF and others, all making sure that we're all moving together on this uh, really important journey uh, into the future. So there's uh, a lot going on on the 2D side. So Chris Brown, uh, what uh, what kind of impacts are you seeing in RFID on from consumer and regulatory demands? Hey, uh, so Steve has been talking essentially about getting more and more information onto packaging using barcodes, specifically 2D barcodes. My perspective, of course, is RFID. Now, with RFID, we're on board with the idea of getting more and more information onto the packaging. But unfortunately, with RFID, we face sort of a competing objectives situation. Uh, on the one hand, we want more information on the packaging level. On the other hand, from technical and financial perspectives, uh, we want less and less data onto the RFID label. So the trend that is really happening right now is that the RFID community, uh, the standards organizations, the industry users, the application users, we're all coming together regularly and repeatedly, and we're essentially hammering out a compromise between these competing objectives. So we are determining which item critical product attributes should go directly onto the RFID chip that's on the package versus which product attributes end up needing to be stored in some kind of remote database. So the trend is new encoding and reading standards that will embody this compromise. That's the direction we're going over in the RFID world. It would be nice if we could get everything into the chip, but technically and financially, it's not feasible. Right. So Stephen, mm -hmm. fresh food is seeing wide adoption of 2D barcodes already. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the concept of fresh food, can you define it and um, help us understand the benefits that we're seeing? Sure, absolutely. Um, so when you think of fresh food, one immediately thinks of um, you know apples, bananas, uh, lettuce, uh, tomatoes, and things like that. So they're absolutely part of that category, but it's a bigger category that includes poultry, meats, fish, and also prepared meals. So, um, for example, if you go to the store and you you buy a, um, a Caesar salad mix, that's a that's an example of a prepared meal, 
or if you go and buy a uh, a meal that's prepared that has sushi and things like that and all, all that sort of stuff in, in one packaging, that's also part of the fresh food category. And you're right. It's, um, it's seen the most major adoption of 2D and the kind of key to that is that it's all been through what's called mutual agreement. So the adoption is happening and the, mat the most of that adoption is around GS1 data matrix, but it's really controlled within an environment. Um, in, in history, uh, the uh, the start of the fresh food and how to handle uh, prices and things like that for fresh food was with a linear barcode that was actually um, we call the uh, restricted circulation number, but it's really a local number that goes into the the EN or UPC, and it had a price and a weight attached to it in that barcode. Then uh, after that, GS1 data bar came into play and that then gave the retailers and producers the ability to, to have a barcode, a linear barcode that had um, the G10 plus maybe the, the batch lot and a date, um, um, like an expired or best before date. But that barcode had um, it itself, when you add those that additional data is fairly large. And when you take that, that barcode and you put it on, let's say a, uh, a ham or uh, a leg of lamb or something that is misshapen and then goes into the freezer and comes back out again. It was actually scanning, creating some scanning problems. The journey to data matrix, uh, one of the first adopters was actually in 2016 and that was Metro in Germany. Um, Metro has really uh, taken uh, that data matrix and uh, GS1 data matrix and done wonderful things with it. They immediately realized that by using GS1 data matrix, it actually improved their throughput at the point of sale, which was a, a big surprise for them. They thought it would slow it down. But then it also gave them the opportunity to uh, create an app that helped the consumer understand, let's take the journey of a fish. So this consumer scanned a, a fish that they were bought, buying at the uh, at the metro store. From that, they could find out where that fish was caught, how that fish was caught, was it done, you know, what kind of net was used, for example. Um, they could find a lovely picture of the factory that processed the fish. They could get uh, recipes on uh, how to cook the fish. And today you can even find the best wine pairing for that fish. So it's really advanced. But beyond that, they, they've taken it and for their professional shoppers, uh, they've given them the opportunity. Professional shoppers are those that are buying for restaurants. So because they have control over their uh, inventory and they know because of the GS1 data matrix what the expiry date is, they know when, for example, salmon is getting close, salmon that's on the shelf is getting close to their expiry date. They could actually proactively reach out to their professional buyers and those professional buyers can come in, scan their 2D that says that they're a professional buyer, buy that fish at a discount, um, ensuring that the, the fish is being used. And then it ends up uh, going to the store and lo and behold, there's a, uh, a salmon um, you know, salmon is now on the menu and it's uh, at uh, a discounted price for the consumer. So everybody wins by, by using that. There's other examples around the world. Um, for example, if we're talking about prepared meats, 7-Eleven uh, in Thailand now has 12,000 stores scanning uh, the GS1 data matrix on prepared meals. And they're ensuring that those meals are going out to the consumers and they're not expired. And so they can catch that right at the point of sale and ensure that uh, every meal that leaves the store is uh, uh, fit for purpose. And beyond that, um, recently, uh, as I said earlier, there's the, there's digital link and, uh, syntaxes and that's being used in QR codes for, for the most part. A deli in Brazil has now converted their entire inventory over to QR codes with digital link, and they're leveraging it not at the not only at the point of sale. So scanning a QR code at point of sale and getting the the necessary expiry date and weights and things like that to uh, price the unit and also uh, reduce the inventory. 
but the consumer can use that same QR code to, uh, to link out to other information. Like for example, if it's a cheese, they can see what the area it came from and they can figure out things like the, uh, um, the carbon footprint of their cheese if they wanted to. So a lot of things are happening in 2D and uh, in that fresh market, they're really leading the way because the use case, the business use case is great for the, uh, the, both the retailer and for the consumer. On the retailer side, Woolworths, for example, says that they're saving seven associate hours per day times a thousand stores because the associate doesn't actually have to go out and look on the shelf anymore to know what the expiry date of the products are. So it's been a, it's been a really good journey and, a, and um, it's really amazing how 2D is uh, working for retail and, and uh, consumers together. So Chris, for the last 20 years or so, we've heard, this is the year of RFID. Uh, but I think it's real now. Um, recent announcements from Nordstrom and Walmart, maybe we're there. Uh, you said that RFID labeling is set to take off. What's the current state of RFID adoption? How many tags are we using? What functions are they performing? Where will they appear next? Okay. Uh, yes, this is the year of RFID. It's taking off. Uh, the numbers that we have say that in 2021, we used about 29 billion tag chips. That is about a 40% increase over 2020. So something is happening. Uh, where those tag chips are being used? Well, the biggest consumer of those chips is still what we call retail apparel applications. So if you head down to your local shopping mall, go to Nordstrom, Macy's, whatever, and you look at that Nike sweatsuit, there's a very good chance it'll have an RFID label attached to it. So that has traditionally been the biggest consumer and still is. Uh, as far as our, where RFID is gonna appear next, I like to kind of put this into two categories, two buckets. Uh, the first bucket is the industries and the applications that have been using RFID already for a number of years, but only in a relatively limited scale. Uh, for example, warehousing, logistics, uh, tires, the tire industry, the food industry that Steve talked about, automotive parts marking, uh, even cannabis and horticulture. They've all been tinkering with RFID for a few years. There are even established applications that are up and running, but we've only been touching the tip of the iceberg up to this point. So I think that where tags will be getting used more and more in the future, the first bucket is this category that's set to explode. Uh, cannabis, for example, is only used RFID is only used in cannabis in a very limited capacity, but if you think about the number of plants and the applications, RFID is a great fit, so we think it's going to really take off and consume a lot of tags. The second bucket is sort of anything and everything that people can think of, that people can cook up. Uh, we don't really know what's coming next. People come up with all these crazy ideas, and Many of them will not succeed and consume and spread RFID, but a certain percentage of them will. They'll mostly be surprises, but they are coming and they're taking off right now uh, in sort of a proof of concept and pilot stage. But again, a certain percentage will take off and consume a lot of tags. Um, on this question, there's also the issue of the supply chain that relates to this. There are supply chain problems with RFID inlays and chips. Uh, so far, these supply chain issues have not stopped RFID adoption. We've been able to overcome these problems, these supply chain problems. Basically, we've been able to overcome these problems with alternative inlays and chips. That's been our solution so far. It's not great, but, it, but it's working and it's keeping the growth and adoption going. 
The real question, and I don't have a good answer to this, is whether we are going to run out of these alternative options first or whether we're going to get the supply chain fully back up and running before we run out of the alternative options. Again, I don't know which is going to win the race, but I hope we can get the supply chain up and running first. Okay, let's talk about something near and dear, I think, to all of our hearts, interoperability. Um, it starts with standards and data syntax and taxonomy, right? But there are special considerations in RFID uh, and refinement and clarification of standards is a hurdle to adoption. So Chris, can you talk a little bit about these standards, their impact and what kind of progress we're making? Okay, uh, so interoperability, it's a big thing that I focus on, but whenever I start talking about this or working with somebody on this, I like to go backwards a bit and start from the perspective of barcodes. Uh, if we think about, I can go to a grocery store down my street here, I can grab a bag of potato chips, take it up to the checkout counter, they can scan it, they will know that's a Lay's barbecue potato chips, two ounce bag, it's all good to go. I can hop into my car, drive across the country, go to a completely different grocery store chain, grab that same bag of chips, take it up to the checkout counter, and they're gonna know that it's also a Lay's two ounce bag of barbecue potato chips. They get the results and they get the same result. So we start from the perspective that barcoding has been amazingly successful in terms of interoperability and that's because of the standards behind the barcodes. With RFID, we're trying to move in the same direction. We do have standards out there that are designed to drive this interoperability, but I would say that we've come up a bit short uh, in two respects. Firstly, we have not nailed down precise standards by application and industry. And secondly, we have not adequately trumpeted or promoted or broadcast, hey, people, when you're encoding RFID tags, please use standards. So in the RFID world, there's a lot more Wild West going on, what people are encoding. Uh, and this is creating interoperability problems. So what's happening now is that the RFID industry uh, GS1, uh, all of the industries and applications that are using RFID. We have acknowledged these problems. That's a good first step. And secondly, we are sitting down together. We're working through the business requirements and the applications. We're defining them. We're working then with the standards organizations like GS1 to come up with new, better encoding standards and those should be released soon. And when we do, then we need to really trumpet, hey, people, use these encoding standards. Uh, I haven't talked yet about the issue of tag clutter or what some people call tag pollution. So far, people have been getting away with these Wild West encodings because there are relatively few tags out there. I mentioned 29 billion tags. That may sound like a lot. It's not. There are literally trillions of items that we could and probably will eventually tag with RFID. Tag clutter or tag pollution is when tags from one application start interfering with another application. The solution to this is to encode and read the tags according to standards. So if we can really nail down the standards and promote them, we're going to get not only interoperability, but we're going to avoid this issue of tag clutter. We're talking about trends today. So the trends here really are, we've acknowledged the problems. We're working on fixing them on both the encoding and reader side. And then hopefully we're gonna get, we're gonna rent a Super Bowl commercial slot and say, <laughs> hey people, please encode your tags according to standards. I'm on board with that. Yep. Uh, 
So Stephen, Chris has uh, introduced the massive amounts of data that we're processing here to begin, begin the discussion. And, and especially with the global migration to 2D, what kinds of issues do non-standard numbers in barcodes or RFID uh, chips, what kind, of, what kind of issues do they cause? Okay, uh, actually, I think I want to, if you mind, I'm going to put it on his ear and, and take a cue from how Chris was saying and, and, and talk about the positives of the standard. And then you can immediately think at the end what the negatives are, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, so with the, the GS1 system is really grounded in um, identification. Um, so you've got uniquely global identify assets, documents, um, entities, location services, items, and so on. On the global migration to 2D, um, with respect to trade items, the GTIN, like uh, Chris was saying, and it sounds like Chris is in Texas, and since I'm in Atlanta, I'll use Coke as the example. So the same idea, the, that GTIN uniquely identifies the product uh, and I could buy a Coke here, buy a Coke down in uh, Argentina, in India or anywhere. And it's the same barcode and the same data. So that creates that interruptibility because you've got the same base. And if you don't have that same base and you've got different numbers, numbering systems and it hasn't been agreed to, um, so industry hasn't come to the agreement to use that number, then the interoperability falls apart. And that G10 enables many things. It's very similar to what Chris was saying. Um, the G10 enables, for example, the, um, the event sharing. So EPCIS is a, is a, a communication protocol that helps uh, share the events of the journey of a product. So, you know, the, the, the Coke was created, it went, uh, went into a shipping container, what temperatures did that shipping container have? Where did it go through? All those sort of things are taken. Also, um, global, class, uh, global product classification is needs the G10. So uh, the G10 is part of that. Okay, so I've got a G10 and that Coke is a soft drink and it's all referenced through the global product classification that could be used for yeah, uh, you know, bringing a product into a country, for example, in the classification. And also the GTIN is the, the key, if you will, for master data. So Chris again was talking about having to uh, maintain uh, a size. So if you have the GTIN, then you can point to the master data and get that data from a data pool or so on and things like that. But beyond just the standards for the numbers, you have to also have the standards for the structure. Again, same thing that Chris was talking about with regards to new encodings, or if you will, new, new structures in the tags. Uh, for GS1, we have three structures for barcodes. You've got the plane, which is used for in EAN and UPC and uh, ITF14. And then you have uh, GS1 element strings, which is the which is used for uh, GS1 data matrix, GS128, uh, and so on. And then you've got the, the newest one, which is the digital link syntax. But no matter what syntax you use, um, industry has come to agreement. Um, scanning systems, uh, most scanning systems can today handle the, uh, all scanning systems can handle plane. Most scanning systems can handle, handle the um, GS1 element strings, GS1 data matrix. Uh, and um, now they're starting to uh, basically handle and know what to do with uh, barcodes that carry digital link. And from that, what happens is in all of those situations, the, um, the, the scanner and the backend system know that an O1 represents uh, the data after an 01 is going to be a G10. The data after a 10 is going to be the batch lot. The data after uh, 17 is expiry, 21 is serial number, and so on into, you know, down to digital signatures. So it's not just the numbers being non-standard, but it's all of it has to have a system of standards to be able to truly make that interoperability and maintain uh, the, the massive amount of data so you can reference them if you can. And if those that data that's needed to be in the barcode needs to be in a structured way and globally interoperable so that uh, everybody knows what the product is, for example. How's so <laughs> so uh, we're really poised at the cusp of an era 
of uh, item level traceability. It's an interesting time. We finally have the technological infrastructure to manage these vast amounts of data. And uh, we all carry around in our pocket a computer that has more power than it, than it took to get man to the moon. So um, consumer demands are really driving this at, this at this wonderful time when all of a sudden we have the data infrastructure to manage it. Um, I'm interested in learning uh, where each of you see adoption of item level identification and traceability, uh, and also how standards and technology uh, are going to enable this. Chris, you go first. Okay. Uh, item level traceability. Uh, for RFID, you need to understand that there are trillions and trillions of items that we could potentially want to track and trace. So we really only have about 100 billion tagged items that are floating around out there. Maybe only 30 billion are being traced at any given, or are still, still being traced. So in terms of adoption, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, we're just starting to experiment with this in terms of RFID. But it's a good starting perspective to understand that we're just getting started. Now, if we want to progress to item level traceability with RFID, two key things really need to happen. These things are happening. There are trends that you can keep an eye on. And uh, the first one is, which I've been harping about already, is that people need to use standards to encode and read the tagged items. If everybody's encoding their tags with their own proprietary numbering system, if you ship me a product and somebody else ships me a product, there's no guarantee that I'm gonna be able to read those products that are coming in. If everybody's using the same standards, that will facilitate item level traceability. Uh, the other big thing that needs to happen is we need to figure out solutions to keep track of all the data, to store the data and to share it securely. A trend that is unfolding right now is that all kinds of platforms, software solutions, uh, even academic projects are popping up where people are trying to make solutions to track and share the data. Um, by the way, if you want information on that academic project that's going on, it's sponsored by Impinge and there is even a financial reward if you can design a platform to store and share all of this data securely. Uh, so those two things need to happen, the standards and solutions for tracking and for storing and sharing the data securely. I'm supposed to be neutral in all of this, but as Steve mentioned initially, GS1 is a not-for-profit organization. It's a standards organization by mandate and design. Um, I personally am a big supporter of GS1 for the data storage and sharing. GS1 doesn't necessarily need to store the data themselves, but GS1 need, standards need to come into play so that we can properly share, store and share the data across all the users. Uh, you don't want me reading your healthcare patient record. You want the physicians to have access to that. So all of that needs to be taken into account. GS1 as a not-for-profit standards organization is ideally positioned to lead that charge for data storage and sharing. Uh, so item level traceability with RFID not happening yet uh, on a mass scale, but if we can take care of those two issues, it has a lot of promise. So that was a great lead in and a nice commercial for GS1, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, Accidental, so, but true. <laughs> so, Stephen, um, what's your take on item level traceability? I know, you know, one of the things that, that I hear a lot is that, um, you know, RFID is difficult here, but right now we have, we have pharmaceutical manufacturers who are aggregating um, item level. Uh, codes, barcodes into RFID on the 
on the case and package level. So, I mean, I think it's um, it's facilitating item level um, item level traceability in, in a different way than we would normally think. Um, but Stephen, I know you have an awful lot to say about this. So. No problem. I so you know you can only as as we said earlier you can only do so much with the EA and UPC and healthcare for sure has been the the industry that has been the groundbreaking and really pushing the envelope with regards to item level or if you will instance traceability. So uh, the regulated standard is GS1 data matrix. And the requirement is to have the G10, the batch lot, the inspiry date, and the serial number. So you have very granular information about that product. And that um, not only happens there, but if we take that whole healthcare example, um, they can easily identify down to the product level uh, if there is a recall or anything like that. And as part of the clinician and the, the hospital theaters, the requirement is to scan the barcode, make sure everything's okay. And if they use that, and then on top of that, you know, if you go to the hospital, you're going to get a, a wristband. And on that wristband is going to be a GS1 data matrix, which connects you to your, your information. And that information might be held by the hospital locally. It could be a company like um, Epic, where they have the, they have, if you will, the, uh, the data pool. And so now with that instance level and those, that scanning capability, the, uh, the operator, the person, the clinician can recognize if the product is okay to use. And on top of that, because they've scanned you, the system com can come back and say, oh, wait a minute, you're allergic to that and you should give it to them. So there's really a lot going on around that. The, that instance level and that traceability uh, is, is, is amazingly uh, not just on um, the products that are being used in healthcare. Now we're starting to see it uh, even in uh, fresh produce. So instead of uh, having a, uh, a batch number, um, you're getting a, a, a case, if you will, with a, with a serial number that's coming from a producer. And that case is being scanned. Uh, it could be using a GS1 data matrix. Uh, it could be using a QR code. It could be using an RFID tag. And it's being scanned and it's being watched through its journey. And so you can determine from that case level, uh, you, know, what, you know, what's happened to that product, what temperatures um, you can... Uh, use that same information now and go to, depending upon the solution provider that's doing that traceability for you, instance level traceability, you can actually get into finding out, okay, so they've got the barcode, they know that they have the, 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 the data around the G10 and the, and the serial number, they didn't even put a batch on it, the serial number, and they can go back to the farm they could, they can, uh, so they, as a consumer, you can see what farm it came from, you could literally see what fertilizers were used during that growing season, how the growing season was. Uh, you can determine uh, the, um, again, the, if we're thinking about the carbon footprint of how, how that got to you, what was it exposed to? So it's amazing what the amount of data and different solution providers are coming with to help the consumer and the industry know uh, what's happened to either the pharmaceutical or down now into the, the product, the things like uh, produce. It's amazing. So um, the last trend we're going to talk about today uh, is more of an economic and societal trend than what we call labeling trend. Uh, it's e-commerce and it presents a unique set of issues. Um, I, I'm interested in hearing what you both have to say about that in the context of standards and technology. So Stephen? Sure. So with e-commerce, what's well, the best way to say it? It's, it's stole a new frontier and e-commerce has multiple cha challenges. And on top of that, what's happening is because it's a new frontier, the different e-commerce different e areas have 
divergent methods, which you know eventually comes back to standards, right? So today, for example, uh, you have e-commerce sales sales related things like buy on buy online pickup in store, also uh, a known acronym now called BOPIS. Uh, you've got uh, mobile shopping carts that are uh, involved. You've got buy online for delivery. And you have marketplaces that are just marketplaces that are grown through the e-commerce market. And then you have traditional retailers also playing in that market. So again, you've got uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, the retailers are coming from, if you will, an, a known standards point, point coming into the environment. And the marketplaces are looking to standards and now starting to use G10s and things like that. But uh, it, it, it's still uh, very divergent uh, in terms of what's happening. Of course, you know, you've had the pandemic and, the, and that has created an acceleration of adoption for e-commerce things. And I don't know about you, but uh, you know, the FedEx driver, the UPS driver, the Amazon driver, all know my dog by name. So, you know, th going through the pandemic, there was a lot of, uh, on uh, e-commerce going on uh, in everybody's home. So the, the e-commerce platforms have actually recently come to GS1 and um, we've come together and started a, uh, a you know, with different e industry uh, stakeholders, not just the pure uh, uh, e-commerce marketplaces, but also the, the retailers that are, that are uh, involved in that and anyone that's part of that. And we brought together those stakeholders for what we're calling the modern marginalization of G10 management. So this is a really important uh, standard because when we created G10 and, and that, you know, we know it was pretty much for brick and mortar in terms of the retail environment. That's changed because of e-commerce. And so now we need to, if you will, modify or morph the standards, or if you like, modernize the standards to help out the uh, the marketplaces so you know and the idea here is so that sellers and consumers will both benefit uh, from a common standard um, let's take an example of uh, bundles uh, i decide that i'm going to put a, a a bundle together and i'm going to put um, a whiteout a pen a pencil and uh, and i'm going to put them together and i'm going to sell them on a marketplace Chris decides to do the same thing. He's going to put the same uh, whiteout pen and pencil, and it's going to go on. And so is uh, so is Elizabeth. But you know, I'm me. So the person that buys the bundle from me is going to get all those things in a bubble wrapped envelope, and it's going to arrive to them. Chris is Chris, so Chris is going to actually send it in a nice box with a little thank you uh, 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 a card along with you know other items that he bundles. And then Elizabeth, being Elizabeth, is going to send it in such that uh, that cardboard box flips into a death set for those people. And so when you look at a bundle, they're not created equal. So defining the bundles and understanding what they mean to the environment, to, to, the, to that uh, ecosystem. Uh, and then you think about uh, refurbished. Uh, you know, every marketplace has a refurbished category. But refurbished means a lot of different things. It's really a condition of the product. And to be able to understand that, that you know, the value of that refurbishment and so that the marketplaces can properly uh, uh, guide the consumer so that they know what that refurbished product means. Was it um, just cleaned up and then uh, made sure it works and that's refurbished? Was it replaced with OEM parts? Was it replaced with aftermarket parts? Now, all those sort of things, uh, you know, come into that condition. Is it like new? What do all those things mean? So having a common standard around that. And then there's also uh, another example is white label. A white label product is something like a USB stick. So there's many, many manufacturers of, the, of that USB stick. And I could be buying that, that, that USB stick. It could be Chris buying it and it could be Elizabeth buying it and we're all delivering it to the marketplace. How does, how does that un-G10 product that arrives to us now get into the marketplace? Who is responsible for the quality and warrants that product? And 
who allocates the GTIN for those refurbished products, those bundles, and uh, those white label products. So all of those questions are being uh, thought through and worked on uh, in that um, GS1 modernization project uh, that's happening right now. And so e-commerce, like I said, very much a, 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 a new frontier, uh, but they're now starting to um, you know, co you know, get, get around G10 and the use of those standards because a lot of the products on the market on that market already have a G10. So now um, you know, figuring out how to create standards that work across all the marketplaces that help both the consumers and the sellers, as well as the marketplaces to be able to help align and um, the products when somebody's uh, doing their searches. So that's uh, uh, e-commerce and some of the things that are happening there. So Chris, uh, e-commerce and RFID. Okay, uh, so when I think of e-commerce challenges or issues and RFID, almost all of the issues and challenges can be boiled down to two sort of fundamental challenges. The first is inventory. And the second is location. Inventory, what do I have? And the second location, where is it? Uh, fortunately, RFID is very well suited to address both of these challenges for e-commerce. Uh, RFID does not handle these challenges perfectly, but it's good enough at this point, uh, technically, financially, the ROI all makes sense. And RFID is getting better at handling these challenges every day. Uh, now where standards come in for the first challenge, inventory standards play a huge role. One thing we haven't talked about with RFID yet is what we call large populations of tags. And another problem is fast moving tags. So when you're dealing with inventory, you can face the problem of large populations of tags. You wanna push one button and be able to inventory thousands of tags. And the other problem we face is fast moving tags. And these two problems can occur in isolation or together. Uh, fast moving tags, imagine you have a forklift with a pallet of tagged items on it. And that forklift, the guy is driving very fast today. He goes through an RFID reader portal at 30 miles an hour. And you have another guy driving in the other direction with a pallet of tags. We, there we might have both large population of tags and fast moving tags. So to address that challenge, those sub problems of the inventory problem with RFID, we go right back to standards. So standards-based encodings and standards-based reader systems allow us to avoid those problems. For location, standards don't really play a big role. I really generally just have one item. I wanna find the Nike size 10 and a half Air Jordan lime green shoes. I can find that with a non-standards-based encoding. But for locationing, the technological aspects are very important. Uh, when we first started monkeying around with RFID in the early 2000s, maybe I could tell you in approximately which room something was. Maybe I could tell you where it was last read and therefore get some kind of location information from that. Over time, the technology is getting better and better at what we call locationing. Uh, you know, got down to 10 meters, five meters, one meter. Today, we can pretty reliably get down to a couple of feet with, very importantly, with a standard RFID system. So I can implement a standard RFID system to handle my inventory, and I can leverage that system to address the locationing issues. Uh, so I guess the trends here are really that standards-based encodings are critical for the inventory aspect for e-commerce. Uh, if you look at Walmart, Nordstrom, Macy's, their RFID mandates are thankfully standards-based. And then the other trend we're seeing is that the RFID technology is advancing so rapidly 
that it's giving us good solutions for locationing. We address those two key issues for e-commerce. That helps us very much. First, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I thought it was a very uh, interesting and technical discussion, which is why I really love talking to these two guys. Um, and thanks, Aim, for the opportunity to talk to your, your constituency about uh, labeling trends.